Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Conservatism. I am excited to be with Dr. Robert Coons again. Uh, this time we're going to be discussing the case for the existence of God. Last time we looked at Aristotelian Thomist metaphysics. Here we're going to actually apply those metaphysical questions and answers to a very specific problem that has uh, perplexed humanity for a long time. Is there a God? Uh, so Dr. Coons is obviously qualified to talk about this question. Um, as he explained last time, what was it? Uh, you went to UCLA, Oxford, and I remember there was somewhere else. Uh, Michigan State is an undergrad. Yeah, right. so and, obviously. Uh, yeah, I'm in Oxford and the UCLA. So Dr. Coons has an amazing repertoire. Um, is there anything that you want to just ta uh, you know, say about yourself real quick before we get into the questions, or do you want to dive right in? Um, yeah, you can just dive right in. Um, I mean, actually, I'm, I'm hoping to write a book about this very subject uh, in the near future, so I think people can keep their eyes open for that. All right, so we're going to divide the interview into two sections. The big section is going to be uh, the case for theism, and the second section will just kind of explore maybe kind of two popular claims against theism, two arguments, if you will. So let's just go into the first mm -hmm. question. So first, can we even prove that God exists? And when do we know that we've had enough evidence to finally say, all right, I can believe in God? Yeah, so that's a big question. Um, so a proof, I mean, first of all, we have to ask what a proof is, right? So, um, uh, and a proof could mean two different things. As you say, it could be a certain amount of evidence that you've accumulated, or it could be in the form of an argument, a sort of de deductive argument. Uh, so I'm gonna talk mostly about the latter here today. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say too much except maybe very briefly about the idea of accumulating evidence for God. So, so if you had a deductive argument, when would it be approved? Well, it would have to be valid, of course, so the conclusion should follow from the premises, but also the premises themselves should be things that would be knowable per se, we might say. That is, things that you could know, or would know, or should know, uh, without needing some further proof for them, because otherwise you'd have an infinite regress. I mean, if everything, while the premises for your proof had to be themselves proved, and those premises had to be proved, and so on, ad infinitum, uh, you will never get anywhere. So there have to be some things that are knowable per se. Uh, and so I, my, I do claim, I think that we can prove God's, God's existence. That is, we can, we can produce deductively valid arguments that have uh, the existence of God as a conclusion, and where the premises are all things that we should and can know uh, per se. But um, that doesn't mean that that's going to settle all controversies, unfortunately, because people <laughs> can disagree about what's noble per se, right? Uh, as we'll see, you know, things like the principle of sufficient reason that we're going to talk about in a little bit. I mean, I think it's noble per se. A lot of people think it isn't. And so, um, so a proof isn't necessarily persuasive right, to everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, so the task of an apologist really is not just to produce proofs, but also to try to make those proofs more convincing to those who don't recognize that the premises are knowable per se. So it's, it's, a, it's a big task, obviously. All right, so let's just dive into the first argument, the cosmological argument. So first, yeah. what does it take for an argument to be a cosmological argument? Yeah, so these, there are three terms here, the cosmological, ontological, and teleological arguments. And I believe that those three terms were invented by Immanuel Kant when he discusses the arguments in his uh, first critique of, of pure reason. Uh, and so, um, so you know, the term isn't necessarily the best term, <laughs> but uh, we, we're stuck with it because of Kant. But, but I think the cosmological argument is roughly an argument that says uh, that God, that reaches the conclusion that God is the uncaused cause of everything else, or the ultimate explanation for the existence of everything else. So any argument that has that as its, as its ultimate conclusion, let's say, could count as a cosmological argument of some kind. All right, so you're gonna to defend today two versions of the cosmological argument. One is the Leibnizian version, the other one is the Kalam version. Um, let's just go into the, uh, the Leibnizian first. So what is the Leibnizian cosmological argument? Yes, right, so, um, so this argument uh, is, is traditionally put in terms of um, of what is contingent and what versus what is necessary. So, um, so the argument goes something like this, the totality of contingent things, things that exist contingently or have existed contingently, those contingent facts, let's say, have to have an explanation 
And uh, the explanation can't itself be a contingent factor. We'd have a vicious circularity. So therefore, there must be a necessary fact that is the explanation for all the contingent facts. And that necessary fact, in turn, if it's going to be a causal explanation, which is really what we're looking for here, that is an explanation for why the contingent facts exist in the sense of, in the, in the sense of trying to find something that has the power to make them exist, that has the causal oomph, so to speak, to make them exist. And so this necessary fact would have to include a being with enough power to make all the contingent facts true. And uh, it's a necessary fact. So that means you have, you have a being that exists necessarily and necessarily has that kind of power. That's the, that's the ultimate conclusion. Now, I've, I've been working recently on a slightly a slight variation on this argument in which I focus instead on a distinction between natural facts and supernatural facts. Hmm. So a supernatural fact would be a fact that includes the existence of a supernatural being. And a supernatural being is a being that is uh, both simple, absolutely simple, and unlimited, boundless in every respect. So if it has any characteristics or capacities or powers or abilities, they're boundless. And they're, they have no limits whatsoever. That would be a supernatural being. And then the argument's very similar. So I would say, well, so let's say a, a natural fact is anything that's not a supernatural fact. It's a fact that doesn't include such a supernatural being. The totality of natural facts needs to have an explanation. Mm. That explanation can't be a natural fact itself or there'd be a vicious circularity. So eventually you get to a supernatural fact, which gives you a supernatural being. And then you can try to connect these two arguments. And in fact, you could run the first Leibnizian argument over again. So let's say we've got, we've got at least one supernatural being. Uh, well, suppose that, that, that some of them are contingent, right? Well, then there should be some explanation for the existence of the contingent ones, and that would give us a necessary supernatural being, right? And in fact, you could eventually get to a, a being that has necessity in itself, right? That, that has necessity and doesn't get its necessity from anywhere else. And that would be the ultimate explanation for everything else. That's the that's picture. So one, one kind of general principle that's undergirding all of this argument is this idea that we need a type of explanation, right, for contingent facts. And this that's is right. generally called the principle of sufficient reason. And Right. Originally, I thought like, oh, there was only the principle sufficient reason, but apparently there are like various different versions of it. So could you explain like which version you endorse? Yes. Yes, right. So um, you're right. I mean, there, there are a number of different versions of it. Um, yeah, let's see, there's so many different <laughs> variations here to get into. Um, but uh, I, I generally prefer to think about it in terms of, of facts, so explaining facts. And but at the same time, it's, it's a certain kind of explanation. As I said, it's a causal explanation. So a fact would be the fact that something exists or the fact that something is a certain way, a certain mm -hmm. attributes. And a causal explanation would be to find a cause that was able to make that thing exist and make it have the attributes that it does. Those, those are the kind of explanations we're looking for. Now, the principal sufficient reason is going to be, it could, I guess you could say it's anything of the form that says, any facts of type X must have such an explanation, right? Um, now there's some versions of the argument, some versions of principle which are completely unrestricted. And they would say all facts have to have such an explanation. Mm -hmm. All truths have to have such an explanation. Um, now this gets us into a kind of a tricky issue, right? Because if you say that, then of course you're committed to saying that some truths explain themselves, I think, ultimately. Uh, because you, you suppose you said, I mean, let's just take the totality of all the facts there are, right? Now, if that totality itself has to have an explanation, the explanation would have to be a fact, right? Uh, Non-facts can't explain things. So that means that something in that plurality would have to explain the whole pl plurality and you'd have a kind of circularity. Mm -hmm. And some people do talk that way in, in the history of philosophy. So some people will say that there are self-explanatory facts as well as non-self-explanatory facts. Mm -hmm. And uh, Spinoza very famously talks this way. Also, Alex Proust generally talks this way. That, uh, that you know, every fact has an explanation. It's just that some facts are self-explanatory. They, they don't need a further explanation. The other way to talk is to say, no, no, explanation can't be circular. It's always asymmetric. Nothing can explain itself. And so then you have to say that there are some things that just don't need an explanation at all and other things that do. Right. 
Uh, and so that's the, I think in, in, it's really a verbal dispute, I think, in a way, right? Mm -hmm. it, it is, you might say there's two different terms for explanation here that people use. And so I don't think it, it's actually a deep issue, right? So I, I prefer to talk in such a way that we don't have self-explanatory things. Um, you can, we can go the other way, but uh, for my purposes, I'll, I'll go this way. And mm -hmm. let's say there aren't any self-explanatory things. So now we need a, a principle to distinguish between those things that need an explanation and those things that don't need an explanation. Uh -huh. So you wouldn't necessarily say like God is self-explanatory in a way. You would say God just doesn't need an explanation in principle. That's right. Yeah. All right. All right. Although, I mean, I could talk the other way if you'd like. I don't think it's a huge difference. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, because I mean. Because there's something special about God such that either he explains himself or. Yeah. Something that doesn't need an explanation at all. Yeah. Right. Right. So uh, why should we accept the PSR or the principle of sufficient reason? Yes, right. Um, so there's, there's several reasons you could give. I mean, again, one, you could just say, look, it's very plausible, right? Uh, it's, it just seems self-evidently true. Uh, and and you, can, you can point to philosophers and thinkers in a wide variety of cultures and his, periods of history who've all been attracted by this principle and found it very compelling. So, um, so I probably would, would claim, yes, it, it's, it's one of these things that we can know per se, right? We don't need a proof for it. It's just knowable per se. But of course, lots of people deny that, right? And so, as I said, as an apologist, it's our job not just to come up with a proof, but also to make the proof persuasive to everyone, as many, as many people as we can. Mm -hmm. So my general strategy, and this goes back, I guess, almost, well, almost 30 years now, 25 years now, is to argue that if you reject the principle of sufficient reason in a, in a, in a, in a, in a in the appropriate sort of way, uh, that is, if, if, you, if you don't accept the right kind of principle of sufficient reason, you will fall into a kind of global or total skepticism about the empirical world. Mm -hmm. So the idea goes something like this, right? Um, suppose that I said, okay, I, I'm not going to accept the principle of sufficient reason. So I'm going to accept that there are some natural facts or some contingent facts that have no explanation whatsoever. That's a possibility, at least, right? Now the worry is that if I say, well, let's see, is there a tree outside my window right now? Right? And I look out and I say, well, yeah, it sure looks like it. But now I have to take seriously the possibility that the mental state that I have, the sensory experiences I'm having of greenness and so on, are uncaused. Maybe they just popped into existence right now in my brain without any cause whatsoever. Um, well, if that were true, then, of course, I wouldn't be able to know that there was a tree out there. In fact, I wouldn't have any good reason to think there was a tree if I'm basing my belief in the tree on those experiences, and the experiences are just popping into existence out of nowhere. Um, and in fact, I think it's even worse, because if the principle of sufficient reason is, is false, then I think we can't even say that it's unlikely that things should pop into existence without a cause. Mm -hmm. Because to talk about how likely it is for something to happen in a particular context is always to refer to the causes that have the power to produce that thing. And to say that, well, the, power, the causes that are there are unlikely to produce such and such a result, right? But if you're talking about something that exists without any cause whatsoever, then there's no way to talk about whether it's probable or not, or likely or not. And so if you, if you deny the principle of sufficient reason, you have to say that there's a, a possibility that can't be dis dismissed as unlikely, mm -hmm. a non-unlikely possibility <laughs> that any particular thing you would point to could exist without a cause, does exist without a cause. Right? So again, if I try to remember what I had for breakfast this morning, and think I had my Cheerios like I usually do, that's based on some kind of memory impression in my brain. Again, now I have, if I don't believe in the PCR, I have got to take seriously the possibility that that memory impression just popped into my head out of nowhere, has no, has no causal antecedent, and so that undermines my, my memory beliefs as well. Mm -hmm. And now you might say, well, suppose we try to restrict the PSR, and we say, okay, let's say that um, you know, human brain states have causes, but nothing else, right? Um, necessarily does. Well, that, that won't get me very far, right? Because now all I have to do is suppose that there's something just outside my brain that popped into existence and caused the brain state. And so that won't help very much either. So in order to get, in order to really secure my knowledge, I've got to keep pushing this PSR out further and further to include more and more possible evidences and possible sources of knowledge. And the idea is that, that ultimately you have to push it all the way. Now, um, now why can we accept God from the principle, right? 
Well, because uh, I don't ever, none of my empirical knowledge is based upon the idea that God has a cause, right? I mean, uh, you know, I, I don't, um, it's not as though I say, oh, well, I know that there's a tree outside because God and God is caused by the tree or something. <laughs> it's just not going to come, come into, the, into the picture. Uh, the things that are going to be relevant to my knowledge, my empirical knowledge, are going to be natural facts. Facts about me, facts about composite complex entities, facts about things that have finite boundaries to their powers and their qualities and their quantities and so on. So it's going to be, it's going to be limited to the natural world. That's, that's where we need the PSR to work. Uh, but once we've accepted that, you know, we extended the PSR to the entire natural world then we're going to be forced to suppose that we conclude that there's something supernatural beyond that. We're going to, uh, to the logical term is we diagonalize out of the natural world, right? So the argument uh, says that if everything in the natural world as, as a whole needs a cause, then there has to be something supernatural as well. So that's the strategy that I've generally uh, accepted. Um, I'll give you an example of something. So Graham Oppie, if this philosopher I've had a lot of ex exchanges with, uh, he proposed the following sort of uh, PSR, modified PSR. So his PSR says, uh, all non-first things have causes. So a first mm -hmm. thing is something that either existed at the very first moment in time or has always existed. So those two things don't have to have causes, but anything else that comes into being in the course of time after the first moment has to have a cause, right? You might think that's good enough, right? Because, um, you know, my brain states are not a first event, not a first thing. The light for, between me and the tree is not a first thing and so on. But the problem is, how do I know that my brain state is not a first thing, right? Uh, I mean, I can't appeal to empirical knowledge now without begging the question. Without yeah about a circular argument, right? Mm -hmm. So the knowledge that my brain is, is a non-first thing would have to be a priori knowledge. I would have to have knowledge independent of my empirical access to the world that would somehow tell me that the brain is, my brain is not the first thing. But that seems to be, it's not obvious that that's so, right? I mean, if, if, I take away, if, if I take away all my empirical knowledge, and I'm, I'm in, in a state that Descartes was in, complete skepticism, I have to take seriously the possibility that my brain is, that right now is the first moment of time, right? Or that my brain has just always been here in exactly the same state that it's in now. And, uh, and so now, again, I can't apply the PSR to it, and I fall back into skepticism again. So, so the only way to get out of this is to come up with a, with a principle that's so broad mm -hmm. that I can know a priori that my knowledge is not, it falls within the scope of the principle. And that's why I say, you know, apply it to all natural things, right? Because I can know a priori that I'm not God that I don't have God in my head or anything like that, right? And so, uh, so I can, if, if, if everything except God has to have a cause, then I'm good to go. I can, I can apply that principle a priori to my experience and escape mm -hmm. the skeptic system. That's the, that's the basic idea. So it seems as if you're saying, like, either you accept the PSR and reality is intelligible, or you reject the PSR and you just go into radical skepticism about everything. That's right. Radical, yeah. at least empirical skepticism. Okay. And then um, th you kind of jumped into this next question, but I, so I know Graham Oppie has the, um, his version of the PSR. Are there any other like atheistic versions of the PSR that you've heard or ways that people try to modify it so they can avoid God? Well, I think the Oppie's one is something like that is probably the most plausible. Mm -hmm. right? And you, you might try and tweak Oppie's a bit in various ways. Uh, but again, I think they're always going to end up with the same problem which is that if you restrict the PSR, uh, mm -hmm. you're going to have a situation in which it's always possible that my own experience, thoughts, feelings, memories fall outside of that, that principle. And, mm -hmm. then, and then you fall back into skepticism. So I think there's a lot of pressure here to have a, a very, very broad PSR. Yeah. And, I, and it just seems like the desire is to avoid like brute contingencies, right? And to... It would seem like the, the nature yeah. of contingency itself requires an explanation. Um, right. I mean, that, in a way, that goes back to the idea that, it, that it's sort of self-evident or yeah, per yeah. se knowable, yeah. right? But if I, if I just reflect upon a contingent fact or a natural fact with some kind of boundary, finite boundary, I can always ask, why is this apple just this big and not bigger or smaller? Mm -hmm. Why is it just this red and not redder or less red? Uh, and, and those sorts of questions do seem to 
call for an explanation, call for some kind of cause. Um, and I think rightly so. I mean, I think that I think we're, we're right to expect such a cause. Um, I mean, another move you could make, and I made this back in the 97 paper as well, is you could say, I mean, suppose you th said the PSR is not something we can believe with absolute certainty in a sense in every case, but we can say that it gives us a good reason to expect uh, that there might be, a, there should be an explanation. Maybe we can't be absolutely sure that everything has an explanation, but we can reach the conclusion that it has an explanation defeasibly. Let's say. Mm -hmm. And so, well, that's still pretty good because that would mean that we would have a defeasible argument that the world has a cause, that God exists. And so unless there was compelling reason to think there wasn't a God, that would give us good reason to believe in God. All right. So let's go into some objections. Uh, so uh, one popular objection to the PSR is that it undermines free will. Um, yes. How would you so this does get Yeah, it does get to, again, back to this issue about how to understand explanation. So if you go the way that we've been doing, in which I've said that things are not self-explanatory, right? Then, um, then in order to, then the, the notion of explanation we need is a notion of explanation which the explanation does not necessitate the explanandum, the thing it explains. It doesn't entail it, right? Mm -hmm. it, just, it just provides you with a reason why it should exist. Yeah. So in the case of free will, I mean, suppose that I, um, Right now, I have some reason to snap my fingers because I'm going to make a point, right? And I'm able to snap my fingers, and I'm free to snap my fingers, right? And now I snap my fingers. Okay. Now, so I think that my free act of snapping my fingers has an explanation, right? Namely, I had the power to do it. I was free to do it. I had a good reason to do it, and so on. But do those three things, do those things necessitate that I snap my fingers? No. It's not like I lost the free the free will that would enable me to not snap my fingers if I didn't want to. I could have made the opposite point, right? I could have said, uh, you know, I also, had, I also have some reason not to snap my fingers, and I had the power not to snap them, and, and so on. So, uh, so, so an explanation doesn't, um, an explanation can be adequate or sufficient without entailing the thing that's explained. Um, Elizabeth Anscombe actually makes this point in, in her uh, inaugural real lecture about uh, causality and determination back in, uh, I think it was 1973 at Cambridge. Um, she says, you know, uh, suppose somebody snaps at me, right, and says something mean to me. And I say, well, here's an explanation. They're irritable, right? And that sort of explains why they snapped at me. That's a pretty good explanation. But does that mean that that irritable person always snaps at everybody at all, in all, in all <laughs> circumstances? Not necessarily, right? Uh, that's not necessary. Um, so, uh, so all you need is something that's sufficient to produce the effect. It doesn't have to necessitate the effect in the sense that it doesn't have to be impossible for the thing to happen and the explanatum explanat not to follow, right, in order to have a good explanation. All right, objection number two, does quantum mechanics disprove the PSR? Yeah, so this is actually a very similar point, uh, I think. Uh, so suppose I've got an electron and it's moving towards these, this screen with two slits in it. Right? And it can go through the left slit or the right slit. And there's no reason, it doesn't have to go through one or the other. There's not, in fact, there's nothing that would determine it to go one way or the other. And I'll say it goes through the left slit. Okay? Is, that, is, that, is that a case where the PSR has failed? No, because there is an explanation for why the electron went through the left slit. Namely, it had the capacity to go through the left slit. Right? In fact, it had the probability of at least one half of going through the left slit. And that's a pretty good explanation. In fact, that's a perfectly adequate explanation for why it did go through the left slit. Now, if it had gone through the right slit, there's also an explanation for that. Namely, it had the capacity to go through the right slit, and it had, in fact, a probability of at least one half of going through the right slit. And so there would also be a good explanation there. And so in both cases, the explanation doesn't necessitate that it go through the left or the right slit, but it does provide us with an adequate causal explanation for why it did. So you, you realize what happens in quantum mechanics is things just don't pop out of nowhere for no reason, right? There's always a potentiality in the situation, which tells you exactly what could happen and even tells you what the probabilities are for those things happening. And those, those pre-existing conditions of potentiality are the explanation for what happens, are the, are the adequate and sufficient explanation for what happens. All right, number three, the Humean modal imagination argument. So I can just imagine something popping out of nowhere. So boom, PSR demolished. 
Yes, right, right. So, um, I mean, there are m multiple problems here. <laughs> I mean, again, one is, um, even if I were to, and there's, there's at least five objections. So, <laughs> so I have to, maybe I should pick the, the top ones. But I mean, first of all, um, imagination is only a fallible guide to, to possibility. Um, I mean, I can also imagine uh, going to the sun in two minutes and uh, that's impossible. Right, uh, so uh, so imagination isn't isn't, a key, isn't isn't always a reliable guide to to, to possibility. Um, secondly, um, let's see. Um, oh well, even if the PSR were only contingently true, right, which is what the P, which is what Hume's imagination could show us, that maybe there's a possible world where things can happen like that. But it doesn't show that it isn't true in the actual world. And all you need is all we need is for it to be true in the actual world in order for the argument to work. Now you could use Hume's argument to to attack the conclusion that God exists necessarily by saying, "Well, I think God doesn't exist, so therefore He doesn't He could not exist, and so He doesn't exist necessarily." Um, but there, the problem is: is it really that easy to imagine God not existing? I'm not mm -hmm. clear what that means. Right? So I don't think that really works. And actually, Askin talks about the other case too. She says, "Can I really imagine something coming into existence without a cause?" It's not actually clear that I can uh, when you actually think about it. And then thirdly, and this is my sort of favorite objection, is that Hume's principle is self-refuting because his, his, the basic principle is: if you can imagine it, it's possible. Yeah. Well, if that's true, it, it better be necessarily true. But it's not necessarily true because I can imagine it being false. <laughs> so if it's true, it's not necessarily true. If it's not necessarily true, it's not true at all. And mm -hmm. so it seems like it's a self-refuting principle. All right, here's a more uh, technical one. So this is uh, Van den Wagen's uh, modal fatalism argument. Yeah. Right, so again, this, this says, look, if, if God, let's say God's existence is the, is the sufficient explanation for everything, right? Well, that would mean that his existence would entail all the natural facts, right? Because he's the, his existence is the explanation for all those facts. But that means that all the natural facts would also be necessary now because they would follow logically from a necessary fact. And what follows from a necessary fact is also necessary. And so there wouldn't be any contingency in the world after all. So mm -hmm. the argument sort of falls apart. And of course, Van Inwagen's argument depends upon this principle that I already denied when I talked about free will and quantum mechanics. Yeah. The principle that, an, that the thing that explains has to necessitate what it explains. Right? And so the picture is that God exists necessarily. That being of God is a sufficient explanation for the creation because he has, God has the power to create this world. And he has a reason to do so. He's free to do so. And so far he did do so. But obviously his existence and his having that freedom and that power didn't necessitate that he created this world. He could have created any other world instead. And so there's no necessity between the, the expo explanation and the explanandum, but there is nonetheless a sufficient explanation, connection between the two. We can see how it's possible for the creation to exist because God exists necessarily and has the power to maintain it. So, as we wrap at least this version of the cosmological argument up, are there actually any troubling objections to the PSR? Uh, I've been trying to comb through and it seems as if we've covered yeah. most of them, but I'm wondering if there's something I missed. Right. I think, well, I mean, I've been working a lot on this problem of skepticism, as I mentioned. And so there are a couple of loopholes there that I'm worried about still. Um, the main one I'm worried about would be someone who said, well, I don't see why I need a principle at all. Why can't I just judge in a case by case basis? Hmm. So I can so I say, do, do my sense experiences right now have a cause? Yes, they must have a cause, right? How about my memory senses? Yes, they have to have a cause. How about the images on my iPad? Yes, that has to have a cause, and so on. What about the Big Bang? Oh, no, right? And then if you ask, well, what's the difference? I could just say, I don't, you know, I don't have a principle. I just sort of see that each of the, you know, in the first bunch of cases, you, you had to have a cause. In this last case, you don't. Mm -hmm. I don't have a knockdown argument against that position, actually. I mean, it strikes me as uh, arbitrary, right? And, and, and I worry that, 
you know, that, that, that one is carving out an exception there in an unprincipled way, well, of course you are, but in, in, a, in a sort of badly motivated way, right? In other words, uh, I want to make sure that I can know there's a tree out there and that there are galaxies, but I don't want to believe in God. So I will, you know, cut off the PSR at a point that just short of, of getting me to God. And that strikes me as, you know, bad practice or something. Yeah. So, so technically you can do it, but it's not desirable in a way or... Yes. How, would, how would you frame it? Yeah, exactly. There's something fishy about it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, something disreputable or something. Yeah, uh, but I, I, it's it, you know, I, I would say that if I were going to defend the agnostic position, I'd probably go that way at this point. So you'd have to be fishy. <laughs> All yeah. right. Yeah. Let's go to the Kalam cosmological argument. So, um, you know, what is the Kalam cosmological argument? Right. So, um, so in ancient times already, there was a dispute between those who thought that we could prove that time itself had a beginning and those who thought that time was beginningless, but it had always been around. And Aristotle famously believes that the universe has always been here and that time has always been rolling around just as well. So, so we're, we're literally in year infinity right now, right? <laughs> there have been an infinite number of years in the past. Uh, and um, Plato, at least in the Tamiya, seems to suggest that the universe had a beginning in time. And then there were later philosophers, uh, especially a man named John Philoponus uh, in Syria, a Christian thinker, actually, who, who, who thought you could prove philosophically the time at the beginning. And that gets picked up by the Muslim philosophers in Persia, the, the Kalam tradition, so-called. Uh, and that's, that's where it gets its name now. So the argument goes something like this, uh, that everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe as a whole began to exist at some point in time because time itself began to exist therefore the universe as a whole and time itself uh, have a cause and you know that cause has to be god or something like god right? mm -hmm. uh, that's the conclusion now i've been thinking i've been i've come to this argument somewhat later than the other one actually um so most people in the thomistic tradition think that uh, the following thomas aquinas think that this is not a good argument um, and, um, but there are others, um, even among, in the Christian tradition, who think it is, uh, Bonaventure and others who thought it was. So it's, it's, a not, it's been a dispute going on for a long time. And until recently, I was not really a big fan of the argument. But um, about, again, about 10 years ago, I discovered uh, some arguments that were put together by an American philosopher named Jose Benardetti, still alive, I think, uh, working in Syracuse, a little book called Infinity from 1968. And he contains some, he, he had, in that book, he has some arguments that I found been very persuasive, actually, to show that time does have a beginning. And that, and that uh, made me think, well, th there's more to the Kalam argument than I thought. It has more, more value than I expected. Um, now, there's some, there are some difficulties I've been thinking about recently. Um, I mean, there's, so the arguments that I like are arguments that show that any particular thing has can have only a finite causal history that there can't be any causal histories that are infinitely long right? and that doesn't actually get you the conclusion that the whole universe had to have a beginning because you could if the universe is infinitely big then you know this part of, one part of the universe could have a beginning a billion years ago another part two billion years ago another part three billion years ago another part four billion years ago and so on so that every part of the universe would have a finite beginning but the universe as a whole wouldn't have a beginning. Um, but I think in that case, you can still get a pretty good argument, actually, because um, you would still be able to say, look, every part of the universe had a beginning. So every part of the universe had to be caused. And it couldn't be caused by other parts of the universe because, um, well, again, if we, if we use something like relativity theory, um, uh, if, if part of the universe begins in a big bang, then other parts that are far away can't influence that big bang. And so, um, and so you, get, um, you get a kind of um, rolling creation, so to speak, but you still have to have creation. You still have to create the various parts of the universe one at a time. And that creator, that, that cause will have to be something outside the universe in order to cause those various parts. So that, that, that's my, actually this is some sort of very recent thinking I've been doing on this. It made me think that there was another bit of a, a loophole in the, in the argument that I hadn't uh, recognized before. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's just go to that first premise then. So the, the first premise can kind of be summarized as whatever begins to exist has a cause. This is sometimes called the principle yeah. of causality. Um, right. Can you prove it? 
Yeah, I mean, I, again, I, I give similar sorts of arguments I did for the PSR. So this mm -hmm. is actually much weaker than the PSR, right? Because yeah. the PSR basically says every natural fact or every contingent fact or every totality of contingent facts has a cause, in fact. Um, the, the, this new principle says, give me a particular thing that begins to exist at a particular time. That has to have a cause, right? So it, it's focusing just on particular events, not on whole totalities of events. And it's looking at not just, well, not just facts in general, but events, things that begin to happen at a particular point in time and saying that those sorts of things have a cause. So it's, I think it's even more plausible that this is something we know uh, per se, right? That just, it's just part of our basic reasoning capacity is that when we see something happening, something beginning to exist, mm -hmm. we know that it had to have a cause. Right? And then secondly, I can run all my, my arguments about skepticism here as well, right? So, um, I mean, I don't, well, in fact, I have pretty good reason to think that my mental states, my brain states, all began to exist at some point in time. Uh, well, if they didn't, if, if, if this principle is false, then they needn't have had a cause. They could have just popped into existence for no reason. And again, that would undermine my empirical knowledge. So I think the same sorts of arguments will apply and will apply even more powerfully in this case than in the other case. All right. And then the second premise, the universe began to exist. So is it true that the universe began to exist? Right. So as I say, I mean, because there, there's some cosmic argument from physics, from astronomy, mm -hmm. that suggests that the universe had a, had a beginning. Um, of course, some people have been pushing back recently. Some astronomers have been proposing sort of pre-Big Bang cosmologies where there were things going on before the Big Bang. There's been some, some there have been a couple of theorems, though, that suggest that uh, even if you go back before the Big Bang, that the universe has to be, the physicists call it past incomplete, is the term they use, which just means having a finite past. So there's some pretty deep principles there in cosmology and physics that, that seem to push us towards the idea that the universe had, a, had to have, have a finite past. But as I say, I'm very impressed by more uh, philosophical arguments, especially some inspired by Benedetti that suggests that, uh, that an infinite causal regress is impossible uh, or an infinite regress in time is impossible. So the one that I've been uh, working with and published a, a couple years ago is uh, what's called the Grim Reaper Paradox. I don't know if you have time to go through that uh, real quick. Um, yeah, sure. So, so um, in, in Benedetti's original version, you've got a victim named Fred, let's say, and then he's been condemned to death. And the way he's gonna be killed is that there are an infinite number of Grim Reapers, each of which has a particular deadline. And if Fred reaches that Grim Reaper, Deadline, the Grim Reaper will kill him. Why? If he's already dead, he'll do nothing. The Grim Reaper will do nothing. Okay. So, now, Grim Reaper number one, his deadline is one minute after midnight. Okay. Grim Reaper two has 30 seconds after midnight. Three is 15 seconds. Four is 7.5 seconds, and so on. So, in other words, they're, they're arranged in, in, in an order that's reverse of time. Right, so the first Grim Reaper is the last Grim Reaper, right? And the, and the second is the next to the last, and so on, in time. And this means that there's no first Grim Reaper that Fred encounters after midnight. In fact, any period of time after midnight, he will already have passed the deadlines of an infinite number of Grim Reapers, mm -hmm. right? A nanosecond, or however small, a millionth of a thousand, it like, doesn't matter. Any, any finite period of time after midnight, he will already have passed an infinite number of Grim Reapers, right? And so it seems obvious that he's going to be killed by somebody, because there's no way. I mean, if he managed to survive all those Grim Reapers, Grim Reaper 1 will kill him at a midnight, minute, minute after midnight, so he's definitely going to be dead. Mm -hmm. But which Grim Reaper can kill him? And the answer is none, because in order for Grim Reaper N to kill him, he had to survive until 1 over 2 to the n seconds after midnight, let's say, or 1 over 2 to the n minutes after midnight, which means is he had to get past an infinite number of other Grim Reapers in order to be killed by that one. And that's impossible, right? So what I did in my paper was I just took Benedetti's idea and I extended it into the infinite past. So now we've got a Grim Reaper at 1 BC, 1 at 2 BC, 1 at 3 BC, 1 at 4 BC, and so on, okay? And now, and I also let's forget the victims. Their job is very simple. They get a piece of paper from their predecessor, okay? If the piece of paper is blank, the Grim Reaper writes his number on the paper and passes it to his successor a year later, okay? So if Grim Reaper 1 gets a blank piece of paper, he writes number 1 on it, and we're done, right? 
Uh, on the other hand, if a Grim Reaper gets a, gets a piece of paper with some other number on it, a higher number, he does nothing. He just passes it on to a successor. Okay. So again, we can ask, has somebody written their number on the piece of paper when it's all said and done? Well, yes, at least one, somebody will have to have. If, if for some reason nobody else does it, Grim Reaper One will do it at the last minute and, and give us a piece of paper, number with a number on it. So somebody will write their number on it, but which Grim Reaper did it? And if we say it's Grim Reaper N, we have to say, well, what about N plus one, N plus two, N plus three, and all the other Grim Reapers? They got blank pieces of paper. They should have written their number on it. Grim Reaper M should not have written his number. We get a contradiction. Right? Mm -hmm. So we can actually, we get out of this story, not just some kind of weird effect, not some sort of puzzling thing. We can actually get a contradiction, right? A contradiction between the infinity of the past and the possibility of a single Grim Reaper doing his job, which seems obvious, and the fact that in each Grim Reaper has the capacity to do his job, right? regardless of what has gone on before him or after him. And if you assume those, those three things, and, then, and, and those capacities are intrinsic to each Grim Reaper, that somehow, you know, it, it, whether a Grim Reaper end can do his job or not has nothing to do with what happens later, let's say, right? It's just intrinsic to him. If you make those three assumptions, you get a contradiction. And at that point, you have to, um, you have to, you have to conclude that one of the premises was false. Right? This is what we call a reductio ad absurdum. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you describe a situation and you get a contradiction, you know that one part of the description has to be false, necessarily false. Right? Uh, and in this particular case, um, I think it's the infinity of the past is the obvious candidate. That's the thing that we can, we can conclude must be false. So, uh, so nothing can have an infinite past is the, is the moral of the story, uh, I think. And that, and that feeds right into the Kalam argument. So, I mean, I should like, mention, I okay. should mention Alex Bruce has also, he's actually written a book about this just recently called Infinity, Causality, and Paradox. And so he, he develops, you know, a dozen other arguments along these lines that support the same conclusion. Yeah, so obviously there are a lot of reasons to believe that, like, yes, it's true that the universe began to exist. You can't have an infinite regress. Um, I'm interested though, like has somebody else said, okay, you know what, I'm gonna try and keep the infinite regress and I'm gonna reject some other premise, right? Like they would try and have a different strategy. Yeah. I mean, what, what do people try to yeah. say in response? Yeah, so there is a, there is a tradition in, in contemporary metaphysics that people call neo humean because it follows David Hume. And the, the main uh, developer of this, this strategy is, is, is David Lewis, a great Princeton philosopher who died uh, a few years ago. Um, and in, 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 the, uh, in this neo-Humean view, uh, things like powers and capacities are not basic intrinsic facts about things at all. Yeah. So whether I'm able to snap my fingers is not a fact just about me, according to this view, it's a fact about the whole history of the universe. Right? You have to look at the whole history of the universe, including the distant future and what's happening in other galaxies, and see whether things like me ever snap their fingers in situations like this. Right? And if they do, then I am able to do it. And if they don't, if they don't, I'm not able to do it. Right? Uh, that's the, roughly, that's the picture. So whether things have powers or capacities depends on the whole history, right? And so uh, if you're a neo-Humean, you can reject my Grim Reaper story fairly easily because you can say, well, wait a minute, you told me that each Grim Reaper has the power to write his number on the piece of paper if it's blank. But how do I know that's true? In order for that to be true, you have to tell me a consistent story about the whole history of the world, right? Mm. And then I'll be able to figure out whether each Grim Reaper had that power or not. Right. And so, of course, if I do that, then I'm not going to get a contradiction. I'm going to say, well, here's the whole story of the world. It was Grim Reaper 7, who wrote his number, nobody else did. And then he immediately come in and say, okay, that shows you that 8, 9, 10, and so all the rest didn't have the power to write their number, right? They must have somehow been incapacitated. It was only 7 and the earlier ones, or the 7, 5, 6, 5, and 4, and so on, who might have had the capacity to write their number. Um, and so that's, that's a way out. But I think it comes at a pretty heavy cost, actually. So most... Um, contemporary metaphysicians in the last 20 years or so have rejected that neo-Humean project. And there's a whole movement back towards what are called powers theories, powers ontology, powers metaphysics. Uh, because, uh, you know, again, we could talk, we could do a whole session on this. It sort of relates to what we talked about last time as well. You know, why, why do we need to have things like powers and capacities and potentialities in our story in the first place? And I think there's pretty good reason for having them. So. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So, I mean, is it possible to kind of like marry the two positions together and kind of say, well, look, you need to have power. Like there, there has to be powers in the world, let's say. And let's say, uh, for instance, this substance has this potential and this potential is going to be actualized and, you know, so forth. So that's the power there. But let's say like it never yeah. happens in the timeline and it never happens in, let's say, any other possible world where that substance exists. Could we then say like, yeah. oh, that shows us that this thing doesn't have the power potential in question. Right. So um, again, we, of course, we have to distinguish here between the um, epistemological question, yeah. whether we have good reason to think it has the power, and the metaphysical question of whether it could have the power regardless of that fact. Right. And so uh, I think a, a non-human is going to say, look, it's certainly possible to have a world where there's an electron that has the power to repel other electrons, but never does it. It's just way out there in, in the middle of nowhere and never encounters any other electrons, but it still has the power to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, we may never know that it does because nobody ever tests it, but, but it would still nonetheless have that power. So that I, think, uh, I think to avoid the argument, you have to make the stronger claim. You have to claim that, uh, that powers can't exist intrinsically. Right? They can only exist in a way that depends on the whole history of the world. I mean, I should say that there's another way out of the argument, too. So if, if, if you don't want to go the Humean way, you have to reject what's called the um, patchwork principle, which also comes from David Lewis, actually. Uh, the patchwork principle says that if, if I have a world in which there's an infinite past, okay, and I have another world where there's just a single isolated Grim Reaper, who does this thing, or maybe there's just two Grim Reapers, right, in succession, then there should be a third possible world where I duplicate the Grim Reaper into all those infinite number of slots in the history that came from the first one. So the idea is the first world gives me the kind of frame, the second world gives me a patch, and the third world gives me a quilt, right, I just put the patch into the, into the frame and produce the quilt. Right. And so the thought here is that, um, you know, if you have enough space and time and you have enough bits that are individually and intrinsically possible, then there should be a possible world where those bits are put together in any sort of way you want. Right. Within the within the boundaries of that uh, that space and time that you started with. Right? Now, that principle is admittedly um, not something that's probably true without exception. So, um, so in fact, given, given the causal principles that I believe in, you can't actually uh, patch things together just in any old way you want, mm -hmm. or else again, you could, have, you could have bottles popping out of nowhere and so on, right? So there actually have to be causal constraints on that principle. But if you satisfy the causal constraints, then the patchwork principle seems pretty plausible, right? I mean, again, what we'd end up with would be a certain kind of modal skepticism. Right. So suppose I decide, you know, I'm going to drive my car to the drugstore right now. Right? And I'm going to take a fairly traditional route, right, of driving down the road and so on. Uh, how do I know that's really possible? Right? Well, because I know that I've done similar things in the past. I know there's enough time in the afternoon to fit in these events into 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 those into uh, this particular Friday afternoon. And so I think it's going to be possible for me to get to the drugstore. But if you reject the patchwork principle, you'd have to say, well, who knows? I mean, maybe uh, just because it could happen, just because it happened on earlier days, no reason to could assume that it can happen on this particular Friday. Um, then, you know, we have to we have to have some sort of uh, ability to uh, have a kind of recipe for producing possible worlds, right? In order to have any kind of knowledge about what's possible at all, and the patchwork principle is sort of giving us that. All right, so let's just, uh, you know, there's the conclusion of the argument, right, which is that there has to be a first uh, uncaused cause, right? And the, yeah. the question that some people might have is, well, uh, you know, that seems kind of like a stretch to me. How can you demonstrate that it's possible that you could have an uncaused first cause? Well, I mean, the argument is, all the arguments we're giving are arguments for saying there's actually such an uncaused cause. Yeah. Right? And so if there's actually one, there's possibly one. Right? <laughs> That's a pretty simple thing, right? <laughs> there's actually a jewel box on the desk. Therefore, there's possibly a jewel box on the desk. That, that's, mm -hmm. that's right. So I, it, it's a mistake to think that I first have to prove the possibility of something and then prove its actuality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we don't do that mostly. We mostly just prove, in most cases, we, we figure out what's possible based on what's actual. 
All right, so let's just uh, now go through the, the general objections of the cosmological argument. By the way, I got a lot of these um, terms and titles yep. for the problems from uh, Alex Press's contribution to the uh, Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so uh, the, the Glenn Doer problem, right? So uh, I take it that the question is basically, is there an ultimate explanation? Is this a worthwhile project? Yeah, or I guess I think, I think the argument is goes something like this, that just because it's, just because we'd like to have an explanation yeah. doesn't mean we can actually get one, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so you might think that, yeah, the PSR tells us we should hope for an explanation, but how do we know there really is one? Mm -hmm. But I, again, I, 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 my argument is that we have to assume that there is an explanation in these cases, or else we will fall into skepticism again. You know, you might say, well, I'd like there to be an explanation for my sensory experiences right now, but how do I know there really is one? Mm -hmm. Well, I better know there really is one or I'm sunk, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know there's a tree out there. So, uh, so in the same sort of way, I think, we have to assume that we really do know, uh, if we're going to avoid skepticism, that things, that where there's an, ex where an explanation is possible, it's, it's really there as well. All right, the regress problem. Right. So, um, so there's two ways around this, right? The first way, and this is implicitly in, in, in the way I presented Leibniz's argument, and this goes back to an earlier uh, Muslim philosopher, uh, I think Elf, or I think it was Avicenna, actually, uh, who, who runs this argument. And the argument is, look, even if there is regresses, even if there are regresses, who cares? Let's just take all the contingent facts there are, regresses or not, right? Lump them all together and say, what's the cause of all of them, right? So if we can assume that not just individual facts have to have a cause, but pluralities of facts, any any bunch of facts that you find, they collectively have to have a cause, then we're good to go. We don't have to worry about regresses. And I think that we should assume that because in fact, you know, we, we, you know, historians will ask, you know, what was the cause of the Civil War? Well, the Civil War is kind of a big complex set of facts and um, it still, it has causes, right, of various kinds. Uh, just because it's, it, just because there's more than one doesn't mean that there isn't an explanation. Um, so there's a, that's one way to go. The other way is, um, is the thing that the, um, the Kalam argument is supposed to deal with, right? The Kalam argument is just a direct argument that says regresses are impossible, right? Because if they were possible, you would get contradictions of various kinds. So, so that'd be my two, two pronged response there. All right. The taxi cab problem. So, uh, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. From Schopenhauer, I think, right? Yes. So he's Schopenhauer. Says, it's like you're, you're using the cosmological argument and you get to God and then you ask the taxi cab, stop, let me out. <laughs> and you don't apply the PSR to God, right? So you're just arbitrarily, so this is, this is in a way, it's, it's, the, it's the converse of the charge that I was trying to make against the, uh, the um, uh, unprincipled atheist, right? Yeah. I said, you can't just arbitrarily exempt the universe. Uh, Schopenhauer says, look, you're arbitrarily exempting God, right? So, so you know, uh, too quote way, right? You're just as bad off as I am, right? You still, you still got a brute fact that you're stopping with, right? <clears throat> um, right. So this is, this is an interesting problem, right? Um, my, my general approach here is to say that um, God is the sort of thing that doesn't um, require or even permit an explanation. So he is an explanation stopper, right? Mm -hmm. And if, if, now, how can we do that? Well, uh, one way to do that would be to go to our next argument, which is the ontological argument, and to say that uh, the very nature of God is to exist. And so, there, so he doesn't need any explanation to exist. He just exists by himself, per se. Um, another way to go is, to, is, is the way I was sort of suggesting about making this distinction between supernatural and natural facts. So if God is simple and unbounded, then there's no, there's no finite boundary there in which you have to ask why, why there and not somewhere else, right? Um, God is at least uh, a candidate for necessity because there's nothing there that's so um, particular or so uh, uh, finitely bounded that it just calls out for an explanation. He's somehow exempted from that. So I think this is actually a very important point. This is, this is an objection which, as you think about it, uh, can actually be very fruitful in thinking about what God would have to be like 
in mm -hmm. order for him to be an exception to the DSR, right? And that, in fact, this is what the classical tradition does do, is it says, okay, let's suppose that there has to be something that's the exception to the PSR. What would it have to be like? Yeah. Uh, and it would have to be something, and again, it would have to be something that's so totally different from the natural world that when we exempt it from the PSR, we don't undermine our empirical knowledge, right? Uh, so, so in other words, we can have a PSR that doesn't include God, but that still includes everything else, right, in our natural world, and therefore leaves us with all the empirical knowledge that we need. Right? That's, uh, I think, roughly the idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I've heard some atheists respond, well, look, uh, I'm going to say that this um, necessary being or whatever, the ultimate cause, is just the universe itself. You yeah. know, and then you could you could say I've heard some people say, well, what you're really calling the universe is God, and then it just kind of goes back and forth. Uh, yeah, well, right. so yeah, I mean, Graham Hoppy does say things like this at some point. So you know, one one option that he has is to say, well, let's just say the Big Bang right is the necessary being, right? So uh, you know, let's say in every possible world, the Big Bang occurs exactly the way it does in our world, right? And so it's a necessary being, and it's the ultimate explanation, and there's no explanation for it. Right. Um, the difficulty, I think, is that the Big Bang is still something that occurs in time and space mm -hmm. and with a particular intensity, a particular, um, you know, this is what cosmologists try to figure out is, you know, how fast did it expand? How dense was it at certain points in time? How uniform was it? And so on. So it has all kinds of very measurable characteristics right, that are quite particular to it. And all of those measurable characteristics uh, are things that call out for explanations, that the kinds of things that when we find them in the rest of the natural world, we look for explanations for them. Right? So again, this PSR, the, a, a principled approach here should apply the PSR to them as well. It's only when you get to something that is completely off the natural chart, so to speak, right? Has no measurable characteristics whatsoever that you can legitimately stop. All right, and then the gap problem. So the gap problem being, how do you get from your conclusion, this necessary being, uncaused first cause, to the God of classical theism? Yeah, so um, yeah, I remember um, years ago I read, uh, Richard Dawkins' book on, on God. And, oh, no. Uh, and, yeah. <laughs> and of course, he says, he goes through the five ways, and he says, let's suppose these arguments all work. Well, so what? That doesn't get us to God. This is stupid. Let's go on. <laughs> well, of course, if you read Thomas Aquinas, you realize that the five ways is just one article, right, in a, in a part of the Summa that goes on for, I think it's another 80 or 90 articles answering this very question, right? Yeah. So everything we've been talking about so far, are, is like step one <laughs> of a process that's going to take another 100 steps or so before we filled in all the details about God. Yeah. So it's, you know, it, it, you know, there's no way I can summarize the whole process here that quickly. But, um, but I, think, I think what we can do is, again, we can look at the clues as to what would God have to be like in order to avoid the taxi cab problem. What would he have to be like to be the exception to the PSR? And that will give us some crucial clues, right? It will tell us that he's something that's simple and boundless. Well, things that are simple and boundless can't be physical, right? They can't be material in any way. Uh, we can also conclude that he's got infinite power because he has to have enough power to create the whole universe. And that, un that power has got to be infinite. It's got to be boundless or else we'd, we'd be back in the text cap problem again. Mm -hmm. So it's a being with, with infinite boundless power. And it's something that's absolutely simple. So, um, so God can't function in a kind of mechanical way. Right. Again, Dawkins says, gee, your God would have to have some kind of gigantic brain somewhere so he could think all these deep thoughts. No, we know that he's absolutely simple, right? Has no brain, right? Um, and so, um, so could such a being be intelligent? Well, yes, uh, it could. In fact, um, the very fact that he has no material basis makes God more qualified to be intelligent than less so, is, is the classical move here. That is, um, for God, unlike for us, God doesn't have to duplicate things inside his brain in order, in order to think about them. They just are there and they're present to him immediately. Everything, every, all the truths, all the numbers, the sets, and everything that he creates uh, is just immediately present to him. He doesn't, have to, he doesn't have to engage in inference. He doesn't have to do any logic. He just knows everything immediately. 
right? And without representation, without any kind of internal duplication. So it's a very special kind of intelligence, but nonetheless, it's something that, um, that in a way, all human intelligence aspires to, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, again, kind of the perfect form of intelligence. And then, you know, one also have to talk about, you know, how do we know there's just one God rather than a whole bunch of gods? There's a bunch of different arguments there. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a nice paper by uh, Jerome Gelman uh, back in the, uh, about 2009, um, where um, he goes, he, he, he uses the uh, cosmological argument to show that it could only be one God. And roughly the idea is something like this. Um, the um, a god a, a god would have to be something that has the power to cause all the contingent facts right now if there were two gods then whatever the other one did would be a bunch of contingent facts right and so the first one would have to be able to control what the other ones did other one did and you get a vicious circularity each would have to be somehow determining how the other one acted and so there's a pretty you know again if you reject that kind of vicious circularity there would be good reason to think there could only be one such being all right in this next um in this next subsection what we're going to do is i'm just going to ask you to explain the argument and then um give us your take on it right so first yeah. the ontological argument right so this is an argument that uh attempts to go from in a way the very concept of god to god's reality yeah and there are various versions of this but i think the best version is what's called the modal ontological argument uh, that's inspired at least by Anselm, his third chapter. It, it may not be what he thought of as the ontological argument, but it's, it's there <laughs> nonetheless in the third chapter. And it gets picked up by Charles Hartshorn, Norman Malcolm, Alvin Plantinga, and others in the 20th century. So the argument goes pretty simple. Um, uh, God's existence is possible. If, uh, if God, uh, God is, in any world in which God exists, he exists necessarily. Conclusion: God exists necessarily. So it's a very simple argument. Uh, it uses it uses a kind of modal logic called S five, right? And and the S five logic basically assumes that that for something to be possible is for it to be true in a possible world. Right? So it sort of imagine a a a a, a, sp a space full of these possible worlds, right? And what it is Whatever is possible or necessary is also possible or necessary in any other possible world. So the modal facts are themselves universal. They hold everywhere. Okay. So now, if, once you have that set up, then the argument's pretty simple. So if God is uh, possible, there's some possible world where God exists. But God is such that if he exists somewhere, he exists necessarily. So therefore, in order to exist in that world, W, he must exist in every possible world, including our world. And then he'll exist here, and then he'll also be necessary here, because he will also will exist in all the necessary, all the possible worlds. Right? So, so that's how the argument works. So obviously, the most important premise there is the premise that God's possible. Yeah. Um, because you can, you can just stipulate that if God exists in a world, he exists in all worlds, so that's just part of the nature of God, that's fine. Anybody can stipulate whatever they want. But then the question is, is it really possible, really possible, for such a being to exist? And um, you know, the atheist can say, look, suppose, I, suppose it's possible that God not exist then he doesn't exist, right? Uh, so that, that argument also works, right? Uh, given the same S5 structure. So if there's a world where God doesn't exist, then God is not necessary in any possible world. And therefore he doesn't exist in any world at all. He necessarily doesn't exist. So what the upshot of this argument is that either God's existence is necessary or it's impossible. Yeah. There's no way that God could just be contingently existing or contingently not existing. He's either necessary or he's impossible. That seems to be a conclusion. So, um, so there are lots of different ways to try to argue for God's possibility. And I think the most fruitful way was uh, developed by Leibniz again, and then more recently developed by Kurt Gödel, the great uh, mathematician uh, in the early 20th century, left behind some notes that one of the students found and that uh, caused quite a stir. And that the strategy is to argue that um, if something's impossible, there has to be an explanation for its impossibility. And the explanation for impossibility has to be a kind of conflict between negative attributes of some kind, like being round and not round, or you know, being six feet over six feet tall and less than six feet tall, or something like that. So that's to be a conflict between positive and negative. And that means that if something has only positive attributes in its definition, then it's possible because there's no conflict, there are no negative attributes built into it. And then the claim is that God is the being that has all the positive attributes. Right? So if you just sort of define God as the thing that has all positive attributes, then it follows that he's possible. 
on this picture and therefore they necessarily exist. Mm -hmm. And then, then the question is, well, what, um, what are the, well, uh, two problems. One is, is existing necessarily, if you exist at all, is that a positive attribute? Seems like it's pretty positive, right? <laughs> uh, and, and secondly, you know, our, our omniscience, omnipotence, goodness, and all these things possible as well. And again, I think they seem like they are. So it's, it's a fruitful strategy, I think. Um, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't put it necessarily in my top 10 arguments, but it's, it's relevant. Also, it's, it's a kind of argument amplifier too. Because suppose that I, I, I get out of my cosmological argument that it's possible there's a first cause. Mm -hmm. Then I can just wheel in the ontological argument I'm home, right? <laughs> because if it's possible, then, then, it's, then and if a first cause is the sort of thing that if it exists at all, it exists necessarily, mm -hmm. right? Then it's going to be actual. So it, it's useful as a kind of argument amplifier, I think, at the very least. Yeah. So it's a nice supplementary argument if you get the, yes. get your ducks in, in order. All right, yeah. uh, the teleological argument. Right. So again, the term comes from, from Kant. And uh, it, this is basically a term for the design argument. So looking at the universe as we see it and finding evidence of intelligent design in it, and therefore inferring that the cause of the universe has to be intelligent as well. And uh, this argument, I think, has, has a lot of value, again, after you've got the cosmological argument in place. Because if you have the cosmological argument in place and you have the conclusion that there is a first cause, an uncaused first cause of the universe, and then you see features of the universe that look like they're designed, then that gives you some reason to think the first cause is intelligent. Because, you know, if, if I see, if, if something produces something, the thing that's, that produces has evidence in it of design, that's a pretty good reason to think that the, that the cause designed it, right? And then the, therefore the cause is intelligent. Um, so, uh, so I think things like the, the fine tuning of the universe for life, I think is pretty interesting. It turns out that there are, fundamental constants built into matter in our universe, of like the ratio between the gravitational attraction and, and electromagnetic attraction, and things like that, which, which physicists have discovered that if those ratios were just slightly different one way or the other, uh, it would be impossible to produce stars, galaxies, planets, biological life, all those things would be impossible. And so it looks as though something very carefully set the dials on the universe making machine and then punched out a universe that produced life. And I think that does, does, does suggest a, a designer. Now, if you, do, if you try to run this argument without the cosmological argument, again, you are vulnerable to the Richard Dawkins kind of objection about who the design got. So yeah, there's a, there, you, you get some evidence that there's some kind of clever designer. Well, that designer must have had some super elaborate brain to design these things. And so that would require another designer and, and so on ad infinitum, so that's why I didn't go there. Uh, but but if, if you already have the cosmological argument in place, you know the universe had a cause and it's this very simple uncaused being, and that nonetheless you see evidence in the universe of design, mm -hmm. and that supports the conclusion we've reached already tentatively that the first cause was intelligent in some way. So again, it's helpful as a supplement, I think. What about uh, St. Thomas's uh, teleological argument? So uh, the idea being like yeah. that things have purposes and you can see that they're directing, they're being directed towards their purposes, right? But I think he uses the example of an arrow, right? So an arrow, is not directed towards its end without um, some intelligent cause directing in that direction. So make the inference, all things must have come from some mind or designer. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think what, what's going on there is something very similar to an argument that um, Richard Swinburne develops as well, which is uh, you know, that we see the universe is very orderly. We see that things regularly and reliably act in certain ways. Right. And um, and that does seem to call for some sort of explanation. Uh, and, and God is a plausible uh, way of explaining that. Right? Why, why do things act in such a way that they're predictably producing the same kind of effects over and over again? Right? Mm. Um, it, when the thing itself is unintelligent, as you say, right? So, so if I produce the same sort of thing over and over again, I produce a bunch of philosophical arguments, you might say, yeah, okay, here's the explanation. Kuhn's, you know, thought them up. And uh, that's why he produces these same kind of arguments. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but if you have an unintelligent thing like electron constantly producing the same kind of effect over and over again, uh, yeah, Aquinas argues that, that that suggests that there's some kind of intelligence behind it. I think that's a pretty plausible argument. Yeah. All right, the argument from intuition. Yes, right. So. Um, this is an argument that uh, you know, has a, a pretty long history, 
go back uh, maybe at least to Augustine, maybe even before that. Um, it's, 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 it's what I would call an epistemological argument. So there's a certain kind of thing that we know or think that we know. And uh, modern contemporary philosophers can tend to call this intuition, which means uh, the way that we know necessary truths generally without uh, being told them or without discovering them by some kind of empirical means. Right? So a good example would be, uh, I know that there are numbers, that every number has a successor, that the principle of induction is, is valid, right? If, uh, if some property is true of zero and it's true, if it's true for n, it's true for n plus one, then that property is true for all the natural numbers. And right? it's the principle of induction. Um, you, you, can't, you can't verify that empirically. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know what kind of experiment you could run to verify that all the numbers are included in the, in the principle of induction. Uh, you don't know it just by being told it by somebody else, right? We just sort of think about it and realize, yeah, that's got to be true. That's right. Uh, so, so mathematics is one area of intuition. Another one I think are sort of basic moral principles. Right? You shouldn't use people in ways that harm them without, you know, good reason, right? Um, you shouldn't, uh, you know, you shouldn't torture small children for fun is the example we philosophers like to use. <laughs> 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 um, uh, epistemological principles, ep epistemic norms, like yeah. don't believe things on the basis of wishful thinking. Uh, take into account all the evidence. Um, if you uh, if you find your beliefs are contradictory, change something. Right? <laughs> those are all norms of, of reasoning and thought, and uh, those two seem to be necessary. And they aren't things that you could really verify empirically. Um, I, I don't think because they they would apply to us, even if, even in a world where wishful thinking worked, it still would be in some sense irrational to believe things on the basis of wishful thinking, I think. It just doesn't, doesn't seem to be the right kind of basis for making a conclusion. And then there are sort of basic ontological and metaphysical principles as well, like the PSR itself. But you know, if you don't like the PSR, pick whatever principle you do like about ontology, uh, maybe Occam's razor or whatever. Um, so there are various norms of this kind. Now, the, the problem is that if there's no God, then what explains our capacity to know these things? What, what explains our believing these things in the first place? And it looks as though the only alternative would be something like blind Darwinian evolution, right? That our, our ancestors think this way and because they thought this way, they survived more successfully than their competitors and we inherited that and so on. So, so of course all that can explain, it doesn't explain the truth of any of these beliefs. It only explains their biological usefulness if, if, if it does work. Um, and there's a gap, as, as Alvin Fanning and others have pointed out, between usefulness and truth here. Um, in this particular case, it's actually, in the cases I, four cases I gave, it's actually pretty implausible that evolution can explain much of anything, actually. Um, I mean, the ability to do proofs in number theory involving the principle of induction it's really unlikely that helped our ancestors when they were struggling to escape the cheetah or you know, um, find a, enough rabbits to live on or something like that, right? I mean, those kind of abstract mathematical principles just didn't help them much. Uh, likewise, I mean, moral principles, I mean, um, it's, it's unclear that um, a moral principle actually helps you survive. I mean, to, to uh, appear moral maybe would help you survive, but to actually recognize the moral truth doesn't seem like that's that's helpful and certainly the kind of principles we use in metaphysics again um it's really hard to see how being good at metaphysics would have given you a selective advantage uh, in, in the ancient in ancient prehistoric times so um so i give uh, in the book that came out a couple years ago on two dozen arguments uh, based on planning as a lecture uh, i give a chapter on this and i actually gave three different arguments uh, one was a uh, argument uh, to the best explanation. So let's suppose that we actually do know a bunch of things about mathematics and morality. What's the best explanation for that? And I argued, well, the best explanation is that God made us. God knew these things and, and created us and gave us those capacities. Because evolution just doesn't seem to have any, doesn't seem to be able to explain it. Right? Uh, the second one was the uh, a kind of transcendental argument that said, uh, if there's no connection between our beliefs and the facts, then there's no knowledge. 
right? So for instance, if I believe that the market went up yesterday, I would say it really did go up yesterday. I don't think it did, but I would say it did. But I believe it on the basis of a, of a newspaper that actually was faked by my neighbor. And he produced it and, and, and he slipped it and replaced my real Wall Street Journal with this fake Wall Street Journal. And, the, and, and in fact, it, 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 it accurately tells what the, happened in the market by just by chance. Right? So there's no connection between my belief and the facts in this case. So having a true belief, even a justified true belief, uh, is not enough for knowledge. There has to be a connection between the knowledge, the belief and the actual facts. And in the absence of God, it's really hard to see how our beliefs about numbers or morality or metaphysics could be connected to the facts in the right sort of way. They'd be connected to a bunch of facts about, again, food and predators in Africa, but there's never any connection with facts about numbers and morality and so on. Uh, and then the third argument was the um, defeater style argument based on, on planning as work. So the thought here is, um, suppose that I, I believe that just by dumb luck, we got to the right beliefs about morality and number and so on. Right? We, just, we just won the cosmic lottery, so to speak. Uh, evolution was totally indifferent to it, but you know, we just fortunately hit on the, right, on the right set of genes so that we had the right beliefs. Well, now I have to think, but wait a minute. I mean, then there are all kinds of other possible worlds, maybe other planets where creatures didn't win the lottery. Right? And they, have all, they think they believe all kinds of true stuff about mathematics and morality, but they're completely wrong because they just got it all scrambled. Um, well, how do I know I'm not like them? Right? And the mere fact that that's possible is, is what planning would call a defeater for my, my beliefs. I should, I should stop having any confidence in my own beliefs once I recognize that if they're right at all, they're just right by dumb luck. That's, that, that would defeat the, the rationality of having those beliefs. So if you're, going to, if you're going to claim that there's any kind of knowledge we have by intuition, then I think we've got three good reasons to believe in God as a, as a creator. And uh, that means if you're going to do philosophy at all, right, you're <laughs> going to need intuition. Right? And uh, so, uh, so really, um, it's difficult to see how a philosophical atheist is going to be able to hold up his end of, end of the bargain here. All right, scientific realism and theism. Yeah, it's a sort of related argument. Um, I wrote a paper quite a while ago now, maybe 20 years ago about this. Um, so in, in science, we, we, we're looking for the laws of nature, right? And um, when you look at the history of philosophy, history of science, it's pretty clear that scientists are guided by two things. They're guided by the data, the, the observations they make. They're also guided by a sense of elegance and simplicity and beauty as they try to find theories about laws that have a beauty to them that fit the facts. Because the problem is that if you take any finite set of facts, any finite set of observations, there's gonna be infinitely many theories about those facts that will fit the facts perfectly well. It's sort of like the, the, um, fit, the curve fitting problem, right? So suppose you've got a graph and you put a finite number of points on that graph. And suppose they're all lined up nicely along the uh, x equals y line, right? And I say, oh, they're a very simple theory here, x equals y, that's the solution. But of course, no matter how many points you have on that line, there are infinitely many curves that you could draw connecting all those points that would deviate wildly from the line and go all over the place, right? So, uh, so why is it that we prefer the linear explanation? Because it has a certain beauty to it, right? And there's lots of even more extreme cases of this in in the history of science where it seems pretty obvious that beauty was the guide and that help, helped us to get to the truth. So again, let's suppose that our knowledge, our scientific knowledge, our scientific beliefs are actually knowledge, not just dumb luck or not just um, you know, things we happen to believe for practical reasons, but we're actually getting to knowledge about the world. In order for that to happen, it would have to be the case that this sense of beauty that we're using to get to our scientific beliefs that would have to be a reliable guide to what the actual laws of nature are. So the laws of nature would have to have built into them a kind of consistent aesthetic quality, right? Mm -hmm. And moreover, it shouldn't just be there by dumb luck. It should be there for some good reason. There should be some explanation for why the laws of nature all have the same aesthetic quality. And I argue in this paper, well, if there's there are not many good explanations for that. Uh, the, the only one I can think of is that there's a God who loves beauty and who, who design the world in such a way that would have these beautiful laws of nature. Mm. If you don't have that in the picture, then I don't see how you can get, how you can justify a claim about scientific knowledge, at least at the level of the laws of nature, ultimately.
So what I'm trying to do in both these arguments really in a way is turn the table on the atheist who thinks that you know, we should believe in science and reject religion because there's some kind of tension between the two, between science and theism. And what I wanna argue is no, if you're going to believe in science, you have to believe in theism. <laughs> it, it, it's, not, it's not that they're in conflict with each other. Theism is actually a presupposition of science. And of course, you can back this up historically as well. I mean, all the great original scientists in the Western world were Christians, were theists. And, and in fact, not accidentally so. They, Kepler, um, uh, uh, Linnaeus, and so on, they were looking for order in the universe because they believed that there was an orderly God behind it, a rational God behind the phenomena. All right, before we get into the final section on um, just like two maybe kind of jabs against theism, I was wondering yeah. like, um, you know, as I've thought about this myself, you know, th there seems to be a point where like the arguments at first, they seem really solid and strong. And then when you get in the nitty gritty, you start seeing like, oh, it, you could go this way and that way. And then I know some people yeah. who are agnostics, they get kind of anxious when they start really thinking about, wow, there's just so much information to process. Yeah. What would you say to someone who's kind of on the fence and they're trying to figure out, you know, you have some good sounding arguments here, but you know, there's Graham Oppie over there. What am I supposed to yeah. do? What would be that final push? Yeah, right. It's a good, it's a good question. Um, I mean, I, th I do think one would, one should go back to the fact that human beings are naturally religious, right? No one really naturally, at least we've never, anthropologists have never discovered a tribe that were naturally atheistic, right? Um, and, and, and most atheists will admit this, right? They'll say, yeah, evolution, you know, kind of screws with our minds and makes us believe all this <laughs> religious stuff, but fortunately we got over it. But, um, but look, I mean, if we're hardwired to believe in some kind of God or gods, then, you know, we're, um, atheism comes at a real cost to uh, messing with that design of the brain that nature has given us. Uh, and, and you can also appeal to Thomas Reed. I mean, Thomas Reed said, look, um, if something's a natural belief, it ought to be treated as innocent, hopefully and guilty. Um, you, should, you should go with what nature gives you unless you can show that there's something wrong with it. So there's a sense, I mean, I want to say, look, there's a sense in which, which believing God is the default position here or something like the supernatural. Um, the atheists will try to turn the tables on that, of course, and they'll say, mm -hmm. no, no, believing nothing is the default, right? You're adding all this belief to it, right? But I think, I think that's not really the right way to think about it because, um, I mean, everybody has to come up with something structure to reality, to make sense of reality. And so it's not as though um, the atheists have this relatively blank slate and then the Christians come, theists come along and add a bunch of structure to it that isn't there. I mean, the atheists have their own structure, right? Which, which they think is sufficient in and of itself. The Christian thinks, no, that, that doesn't really work. You need to have this different structure. So, so it's not just a question of more or less, it's really alternatives. And um, there's a lot to be said for um, going with the natural path. Um, the other thing that, of course, is relevant at some point would be things like religious experience. Mm -hmm. So many, many people around the world believe they've experienced God, you know, there are kinds of supernatural realities. Um, again, one should take those testimonies very seriously unless you have good arguments to the contrary. Um, now, again, the atheists will try and turn that around and say, yeah, but they're con they provide us with contradictory evidence, right? Some people see Allah, some people see, you know, the Buddha and so on. Um, but, you know, I think there's um, a lot to be said, though, for saying that, um, that there is still a wide agreement, nonetheless, that there's something personal or quasi-personal out there that, uh, is, that has a... Um, orientation towards the good generally and there's you know, not 100 percent, but 95 percent or something of the religious traditions in the world will, will all have experience of something like that yeah and so mm -hmm. um so you know then i think again um you know it's kind of half glass half empty half full kind of problem <laughs> here but it looks looks pretty full to me <laughs> yeah and uh, mm -hmm. i guess again some reason to, to go to lean in that direction yeah and if i can just uh, contribute my two cents to this conversation one is that you know I, when you study like the different religious traditions of the world i think c.s lewis talked about how um you know basically all the all the cultures of the world have agreed upon like some basic common ethic right so don't kill don't steal and when it even yeah. comes to religion um if I'm not mistaken, historically speaking, like monotheism was the norm or something like that. And, you know, yeah. and then over time, like, uh, 
you know, things kind of got diversified, but still like there's, there's certainly evidence for that. And, and I think one thing that's almost indisputable is that almost every people have some sort of conception of a kind of supreme being out there. Exactly. Above yeah. the other gods, right? That's they right. may not have much to do with, but, but nonetheless, their stories usually include such a being. Yeah, like even in, in Greek mythology, the 12 gods, yeah. they're inferior to like some higher reality or something like that, if I remember. Um, yeah. So, so it's just, it seems interesting that there's this kind of, um, this similarity just within all human beings. And it's not like a gerrymandered similarity. It's just something natural that kind of came out within us. The second yeah. thing is, um, you know, I have a copy of your book here, Realism Regained. Yeah. And I thought about like, man, if, if theism is false and if the Aristotelian Thomas synthesis is false, let's say, or I don't know, some other alternative account, then that's going to come at a huge cost at our ideas of like human dignity about the yeah. reliability of our faculties. And it just, everything yeah. would just seem absurd at that moment. Or you just have to say, oh, I don't know the answer now, but, and it doesn't seem like there's going to be an answer to this question, but I'm just going to hold out this blind faith or whatever. I don't know. Um, it yeah. seems to me that theism is just more desirable. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, Chesterton makes this point that he said at one point, um, science and liberalism in a broad sense, you know, right, human rights and so on, these are, these are two blossoms that were produced by the tree of Christianity, right? And the, the modern humanist wants to clip those blossoms off the bush and bring it in the house because he doesn't like the bush, he likes the blossoms. And in the long run, that's not going to work because the blossoms need the bush for the sustenance, right? They're natural outgrowths of, of Christianity. And I think that's right when you look at history. I mean, the things that the modern atheist loves and is permitted to are all fruits of Christian history, actually. Uh, and so they're, they're, they're rebelling against the root in favor of the flower, and it doesn't make much sense. Just yeah. All right, so now to some jabs against theism. So let me, let's just go to the first one. This the first one's like a very big problem. It's the problem of evil and suffering in the world. Yeah. Um, and rather than asking you like the original three questions I plan on asking you, let me just you know, give you the problem of evil and let me see yeah. what you do with it. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. And take all the time you need. <laughs> oh, that's it. That is okay. Yeah, right. All right. So, um, yeah, so the, it, it's a pretty old argument. It goes back, uh, at least it's attributed to Epicurus and, uh, and Hume repeats it, right? So the simple argument is if God were all good, he would want to eliminate all the evil he could. If he's all powerful, he could eliminate all the evil, full stop. Uh, there is evil. <laughs> Therefore, you know, either God doesn't exist or he isn't all powerful or he isn't all good. The, the, the all powerful, all good God is out of the, out of the picture. And uh, so I, I, I mean, there's lots of ways to go here. I think the whole setup is wrong for a number of reasons. Um, I don't think God has the slightest interest in whether there's evil in the world or not. Uh, uh, he's completely indifferent to that question, I think. Um, why do I say that? Well, because God's not a utilitarian. Right. I mean, the, the, the whole the Epicurus setup is that God looks at the world and says, I want to have as much pleasure in the world, as little pain as possible. That's my goal. I don't think that's right. I think God couldn't care less about the total amount of pleasure or pain in the world. God, because utilitarianism is, is just not the right moral theory. Right. The right moral theory from a Christian point of view is a theory that's based on agape, which is love, love from one person to another. So God loves particular creatures. And so, of course, he wants good things for those creatures, and he wants to relieve the bad things. But that's, that's a one creature at a time kind of attitude that God has, not a kind of global, what does the whole world look like kind of problem. So I think the, the whole setup is wrong right from the start, and, and it would reject the, the framework. Um, second thing, I think that the argument doesn't take into account is that God might have conflicting constraints. So let's say God wants to relieve suffering sure he does but there might be other things that constrain him in various ways mm -hmm. and i think in fact in creating a world at all god has to bind himself in some ways in, in order not to interfere in most cases right so even in, in, suppose there aren't, isn't even any living things in the world there's just a bunch of matter and stars and stuff like that well if he's going to create a world full of stars and planets and comets and so on he's got to let those stars and planets do their own thing right? Uh, and sometimes, you know, the star, sometimes the comet will smash into the star, and sometimes two stars will tear each other apart, and most 
okay, you know? I mean, uh, <laughs> he, can't, he can't just sort of step in and constantly be re-engineering things at every moment to make things happen in exactly the way he wants in that particular situation. You've got to sort of let things act according to their nature. And then once you get to living things, I mean, you can't create a world in which there are sharks. And then whenever the shark's about to eat anything, step in and stop it and, you know, replace it with some carrots or something, right? I mean, he's got to, got to let the shark do its thing. And finally, with human beings, um, you know, he gives us free will and, and, and he's got to allow us to exercise that free will and to and to uh, hurt each other and uh, fail to help each other and, and all those things. Um, and I'm not saying he never interferes, but he has to have constraints in such a way that any interference is going to be the exception. And, and it has to be justified, not just by compassion, because otherwise, since God is no respecter of persons, if, if, you, if you'd have to act all the time that there's any danger of pain. And, and so in order to have a world, he's got to be constrained in such a way that although he would like to relieve the suffering in this particular case, he's not going to do it because he's constrained by the natures of the things that he created in the first place. Um, the other thing that's important to bear in mind here, again, is that God loves particular people, right? So he loves me, he loves you, let's say. Now we might say, gee, God, why couldn't you have put us in a better world than this? A world where there <laughs> isn't pain and no COVID virus and no hurricanes yeah. and so on. And the answer is that wouldn't be you or me, right? I mean, our very identities are tied to the kind of world that we were created in, I think. Um, I mean, a world where there was no virus and no hurricanes and no earthquakes, that's a radically different kind of world. It'd be full of all kinds of interesting people, but it wouldn't be me, it wouldn't be you. And so you can't say, oh, if God loved me more, he would have put me in that different kind of world. That makes no sense. He's going to love me in this world, in the kind of world that is essential to me, right? So, um, so again, um, you know, uh, suppose I get the virus and I die. Um, you know, well, why didn't God put me in a world where there were no viruses? Because it's impossible. It's logically impossible for me to do that, right? Uh, so I need, you know, what I need to ask is, how has God shown his love to me in this kind of world, despite the pain and death and dangers and so on that this world brings with it? And the answer is he's done an awful lot, he's done amazing things, right, from a Christian point of view, right? He became a human being, he allowed himself to be killed and tortured, uh, he was raised again, he offers to us the hope of eternal life and, you know, all kinds of wonderful things, uh, gives meaning to the suffering that we have and so on. Uh, so he's done lots of wonderful things too for us. Uh, the mistake is to, is to pick out something in this world and say, why did you allow that thing to me? Right? Uh, that just, again, uh, mis misunderstanding the situation. Um, fourth point, um, evil is always the absence of some good from a Christian point of view. So, so there's nothing that's really intrinsically evil, so to speak. I mean, even pain. I mean, pain in and of itself is actually a good thing. It's good that I should be aware that my body's been injured in a certain way so I can protect that. Right? If you lose the capacity of pain, that's actually really terrible. Uh, it's a terrible disability. Um, now, of course, sometimes pain is bad. Right? Because it's my belief it or, or it distracts me from other things. That uh, nothing that exists insofar as it exists is, is pure evil. Uh, evil is always the absence of good. Now, now God is all-powerful, right? infinite power, infinite capacity. And that's actually very important. If God were finite, right, then there would be the best he could do. Right? And you would expect him to do the best he could do. Right? <laughs> I mean, why not? Right? Because you and I are finite. And that's why if, if you don't do the best you can, some particular context, I can criticize you and say, Swan, you could have done better. You should have done your best in this situation. You failed. There is no such thing as the best that God could do, right? No matter what he does, there's always better things he could do. Mm -hmm. So it never makes sense to say, oh, God, you could have done better. Why didn't you? He just does it <laughs> because it doesn't make any sense to say that he could do the best. So God's motivation is very different from ours, right? He does things that are good, but he never does the best because there is no such thing as the best. So that means in many cases, he fails to do good things for no reason whatsoever. Right? That, that's sort of my new radical position here, right? A lot of people <laughs> look, why did, you allow, why did you allow this bad thing? Why didn't you do something good? And in some cases, the answer is just, there is no answer. He just didn't. 
period. And so rather than focusing on the things he didn't do, let's focus on things he did do right? mm -hmm. uh, and all the wonderful good things he's done for us. Instead of always looking at the things he could have done that didn't do, for which there's often no reason whatsoever. We're just, we're just applying the wrong standard to God here. And it's sort of ironic, right? Because if God were less powerful, it would be more reasonable to expect more from him, right? Yeah. The very fact that he's all powerful is why it doesn't make sense to us for us to expect more from him. Because no matter what he did, you could always ask for a little more than that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so God just doesn't work that way. He, he loves us. He does lots of good things for us. But uh, in many cases, he, he doesn't do things, and there's no reason. Yeah, I mean... I if you don't mind me interjecting just a little bit, like, um, the, you know, the, the way in which you've kind of portrayed God is kind of like, um, you know, it reminds me of Brian Davies approach and the reality yeah. of God and the problem of evil. A lot of people were like, what, you know, like, uh, you're saying God has no moral obligations and a lot of people were really upset, but yeah. Davies was really hitting at, well, like, you know, the classical theist God is really God proper, right? This supreme yeah. being. And I think a lot of atheists and a lot of people today, they kind of want a more democratic God. They want a God who's kind of, you know, really nice and friendly, not like a king or a supreme being. They want another person, you know. Yeah. That's right. That's like that. That's right. That, that, that puts it well, because, you know, it's precisely because God is so much greater than us, like ontologically, that, um, I mean, I don't want to say that he isn't good. He is supremely good. But the way in which God's goodness expresses itself is very different from the way goodness expresses itself in us. Yeah. We have to take that into account, right? Um, you can't expect, again, you can't think that God is just like a human being, only a lot more powerful, right? Yeah. Like Thor or the Hulk or something like that, right? Because uh, then you can pretty much apply human categories to such a view. Right? Yeah, it's a lot more powerful than us, but still basically like us. But to apply those same categories in the same way to a being like God is just completely mistaken, right? Um, you have to, you know, I raised some interesting questions. I mean, how do I know that God wouldn't lie to us if we didn't break his promises? Um, well, I think we do know that because insofar as God accommodates himself to us by speaking human language, he in a sense voluntarily puts himself under those moral constraints. And so, uh, and so likewise, when Jesus, when God becomes a human being, now you can really safely apply human moral categories to Jesus, right? Yeah. Because he, God has accommodated himself to us by uh, taking on his human nature. And even before that, when he speaks to Abraham or Moses or something like that, he uses Hebrew, kind of relates himself to them as if he were a Middle Eastern potentate. Well, then you can apply appropriate moral standards to God's behavior there. But when you're looking at God creating the world out of nothing, it is so completely different from anything human beings have ever done or will ever do that to try to apply this usual moral categories to that is just complete nonsense. It doesn't make any sense. And so we should stop doing that. <laughs> we should, again, just focus on, you know, what does it mean to say that God is good? How does God's goodness express itself? And not try to uh, superimpose a preconceived model of goodness yeah. on God. All right, to the last question. So, or kind of the last objection. So suppose an atheist says, you know, this is all really nice, but guess what? I don't need God to have a coherent worldview. I can construct my own compelling godless account of reality. There's this kind of question though, yeah. is God inevitable somehow to really have an intelligible reality? Yeah, I mean, I think so. Um, I mean, I find that um, many of my atheistic colleagues are not really particularly concerned about having a coherent world, coherent worldview, actually. Yeah. They sort of focus on this or that specific problem. Um, I had one colleague, he, he's passed away, God rest his soul, but we were on a panel discussion about worldviews, and uh, you know, I sort of explained mine and why I thought it was so coherent. And, and he said, I don't have a coherent worldview, and I don't care. <laughs> I don't want one, you know? Uh, and, uh, and I think a lot of atheists do have that sort of attitude. Yeah. Right? Um, but if you want to have a coherent one, where you want to sort of make sense not only of electrons, but also of people and of physicists, right? Um, then theism is, is hard to beat, I think. Um, I mean, again, Chesterton says in, in Orthodoxy, uh, the materialist can make sense of everything in the universe except the materialist himself. <laughs> and then that's right. I mean, how do you get this being who knows all the stuff about matter and who understands it and who has purpose and can can adopt science as a as a vocation and so on in a in a totally materialistic world it doesn't make much sense 
So, uh, so yeah, I think, uh, I think uh, in terms of coherence, in terms of having a system where the things fit together nicely, um, it's hard to beat it. Again, to, just to stick on this Chesterton jag here, um, Chesterton also makes the good point in, in early, early part of orthodoxy that um, in a way what Christianity does is it says, look, there's one mystery, right? Which is understand the nature of God. We can't do that. Mm. So we sort of, but if you posit that one mystery, mm. everything else makes sense in light of it, right? And that's actually much preferable to having a bunch of mysteries so you know that none of them fit together in a coherent sort of way. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's, yeah. something, there's something to that, right? I mean, there's a sense in which the nature of God is always going to be beyond our grasp, right? We can just kind of vaguely, you know, locate it in logical space. But once we've got it there, suddenly all kinds of other things make sense. Mathematics, science, morality, metaphysics itself, all those kinds of human practices kind of fit, fit together nicely. Mm. Yeah, I mean, God is probably the most beautiful mystery that we have. And honestly, it's the only mystery that I really want to have at the end of the day. Everything else, I think, yeah. you know, should make exactly. sense. Yeah. Well, thank you, Robert Coons, uh, Dr. Robert Coons. Right. Uh, yeah, my pleasure. A lot of fun. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, apologies. The connection has been kind of weird uh, during our interview, but yeah, uh, is, is, there, is there anything you want yeah, to say before we go? Broadband's not as good as it. What's that? Is there anything you want to say before we uh, end the episode? Uh, no, I think we covered the, a lot of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Coons. My pleasure.